Thank you. Thank you very much. WAMU and local independent bookstores are both about curiosity and about community. Books and public radio, as you know, go well together because they're both about you know, storytelling. This is WAMU, is your NPR station, best, but we are more importantly your public radio station throughout the region. We're here this evening to spend time with you and in your community. Remember, we're there for you 24 7 at 88.5 on your dial on WAMU.org or via the NPR One app on your smartphone. Washingtonians are readers, the most literate in the United States, in fact. And so are our staff, some of whom are here today. So if you work at WAMU, please raise your hand because after the conversation is over, we will be here if you want to talk about the station or radio more broadly. So please raise your hands. Sahar, you should raise your hand too. <laughs> Sahar is our junior employee here. There you go. Stay in touch with us at wamu.org slash books and using the WAMU books hashtag on Twitter. That said, Derek, let's go back, oh, 20 years to 1997, or maybe three decades to 1987. We're sitting on this very corner at 14th and V Street. What do we see? What does the neighborhood look and feel like? Well, thank you all, all for being here. Now let's, let's go back 20, 30 years ago. Uh, this was what Kenneth B. Clark might have coined the dark ghetto. Uh, what Elijah Anderson would say is the iconic ghetto. Uh, 30 years ago, this area was majority African American. It was also majority low income. But it has changed dramatically. I mean, if we just, some of you could just turn around outside, right? I mean, what did we have right out there? Uh, on Saturdays, we have a farmer's market now. 30 years ago, we had a different kind of market. We had an open-air drug market. Heroin, cocaine uh, was dealt right behind you. Uh, so this was a community that was struggling, struggling uh, because of discrimination, struggling because of inequality, struggling with addiction. Uh, but it has changed dramatically. It has gone from the dark ghetto to what I coined the gilded ghetto. And in the gilded ghetto, townhomes go for a million, maybe two million, right? For a town home, three bedroom, a row home. Uh, some of the apartments just down the street uh, in the district, right? Going for $500 a month for a one bedroom. We can just look at this room right now and look at the racial demographics, and we got a majority of white people here, right? Um, and that represents, you all, most of you, a lot of you are the millennials who have come back and come to the city. But it is changing the city, but it has changed this neighborhood. This neighborhood, the Shaw U Street area, is one of the most historic African American neighborhoods in the country. I put it on the same level as Harlem and Bronzeville on the south side of Chicago in terms of its rich African-American history, but this community is no longer majority black. It's majority white. In 2010, this area was 55% white. It is probably more than that now. Uh, so there's been a lot of changes, and I think today, tonight, we're gonna talk about the drivers of those changes, but also the implications and I think some of the things that I talk about in the book, which came from residents here in this community, um, will bring a set of complexities that maybe some of you were unaware of. So, Kojo, I hope you have a great conversation. When you talk about having spent talking, time talking with residents, talk a little bit about your research method here, because you spent years working on this book, and you talked to a lot of people here. How did you go about doing that? I do qualitative work, ethnographic. Um, I get to know people in the neighborhood. So I spent six years. I started this study uh, in 2009. And uh, you know, I had studied Harlem. I had studied the south side of Chicago. 
Uh, I was interested in this neighborhood because at the time that I was studying those neighborhoods, and this is the, the late 90s, early 2000s, they were going through black gentrification. Right? So affluent African Americans were moving to those areas. Here, you had the racial transition that I just talked about. And I thought this would be an ideal place to understand the intersection of race and class and the implications of whites moving to a historic black area and what that meant for race relations in the nation's capital, but in our country. And I knew I just couldn't plop down. I didn't grow up in DC. I grew up outside of New York City. I grew up in a suburb. Uh, and I came here. I knew about the neighborhood. Uh, I had read about the neighborhood. And I, I came across an organization, One DC. It's Organizing Neighborhood Equity. And uh, Dominic Moulton is the lead organizer there. I uh, you know, went into his office. It's on uh, 7th and S Street. And I told them about the study I wanted to do. And I said, oh, I've done this stuff in Harlem. I've done this stuff in Bronzeville. He said, this is Washington, DC. This is Shaw U Street. You know nothing about this neighborhood. Get out of here, right? <laughs> and he told me to go home. But he said, go home and come back. And it took a three-month process of going home, coming back, talking to him, talking to his staff, developing a set of trust uh, and a relationship with him that after a three-month period, he said, all right, you can come work for me. You can be an intern. And I told him, I said, I'll do whatever you need. You need me to write grant proposals. You need me to knock on doors, organize. You need me to answer phones. Whatever you think is best, uh, the best way you want to utilize my skills, that's how uh, we'll do it. And in the process, I'll get to know the members of 1DC, many of them who live on the subsidized housing that still remains up and down 7th Street. Uh, so. That's how it started, and that's how I was able to uh, start to understand uh, what was happening here. The scene you described 20 or 30 years ago was when this city was known as Chocolate City. You now describe it as Cappuccino City, and obviously that talks both about the intersection of race and class. But you say in this book that while gentrification is really often about the intersection of race and class, Gentrification in this area, Shaw and U Street, was somehow different than gentrification as it normally takes place around the country. Different how? What, what is so interesting about this neighborhood is the way in which the black history has been commodified and sold and is appreciated by white millennials, right? So you got Kathy Smith. Cultural Tourism, D.C. I mean, if you walk in this neighborhood, it is impossible to not understand the black history uh, of this neighborhood because there are signposts and there are walking trails that were installed by Cultural Tourism, D.C. So usually when a neighborhood is bl branded black, what does it lead to? White flight. Whites leave. Now it's branded black and whites are coming. And that's the atypical gentrification. Whites coming into a minority neighborhood, it, it, that's typical gentrification, right? But coming to the neighborhood because of an appreciation of what was there in the past, some related to the Black Broadway history, but some actually related to the iconic ghetto, thinking that this neighborhood is hip and cool because it once was a crime hotbed. I've never seen that before. I didn't think I was going to see that, and I've coined that living the wire. Now, not all of you are living the wire, right? You all, how many people have watched the wire? Right? You know what the wire is, right? And the wire sensationalizes the inner city. It plays up on the crime, but also the complexities. And there are a set of folks here that I interviewed, the newcomers, the gentrifiers, that are coming back because of the black history, black Broadway, but also in part because this once was the iconic ghetto. They feel like they're authentic and they're hip because they're not living in Georgetown. They're not living in Foggy Bottom. They're living in Shaw U Street. So that's the atypical gentrification that's occurring here. But I didn't touch on the cappuccino. I don't know if you want me to talk a little bit about that as well. Apparently you do. <laughs> Kojo's great. All right, let, let's talk about the cappuccino, right? What is a cappuccino? It's a flipped, refined cup of coffee with milk. It's the beans, 
You take them, you press them. You steam the milk. The frothy milk is the millennials. They are, the white millennials are pouring into this city. Between 2000 and 2010, there was a great back to the city movement here. 50,000 of those people who came back to DC were whites, high wage service workers of the national and the global economy. Couldn't all afford downtown, couldn't afford Penn Quarter, Pennsylvania Avenue. So you're moving to the areas that are a little bit more affordable, and those are the black neighborhoods just on the periphery of downtown. It's U Street, it's 14th Street, it's H Street in Northeast, right? The areas that are gentrifying are the historic black neighborhoods that are just on the periphery of the downtown. That's the pouring in of the white foam milk. And the people who are being displaced, they are going to the outskirts of the city. And they're going to Ward 9, right, inner PG County. They're going to some areas in Fairfax. We're looking more and more like a Western European city like Paris, where the poverty and minorities are on the periphery. So when you pour in that white milk, foam milk, to the espresso, you push out the minorities to the outer edge. Now, a regular cup of coffee with milk is two bucks at Starbucks. You flip it, you make it a cappuccino, it's five bucks, right? And the property values in DC, the median property value in 2000 used to be 250,000. Now it's upwards of a half a million dollars. It's the same thing. We're flipping the house like we flipped the cappuccino. The row homes here that some people got for 60, 80, 90, 100,000 uh, dollars, you know, 20, 30 years ago, you then upgrade it. You put the granite countertops in. You put the stainless steel in. You just went from 250,000 to 600,000. The third wave coffee shops, I'll, just, I'll end it with this. Sure. The third wave coffee shops where you get the espressos, they're all here, right? Compass, you guys have been there on 7th Street. And so we have moved, again, from Chocolate City that was about D.C. being a black majority, but also D.C. being the base of African-American politics. This is Marion Barry, Walter Fauntroy. They took power away from the federal government, brought back home rule. This is African Americans showing that they could rule and run the nation's capital. But as you pour in the white foam milk, you are dissipating and diminishing some of black power. So we've moved from, you know, chocolate city to the cappuccino city. You also, I guess, on the one hand, say that cultural tourism DC in all of the marks, the historic markers that it put up in this neighborhood seem to only emphasize the more glorious parts of African-American history, not talking about the more seedy parts, the, the drug usage and the poverty and the unemployment that existed in these areas on the one hand. On the other hand, you say that people are coming here to live the wire, meaning that people who live here, despite everything that they see that cultural tourism DC put up, understand that aspect of our history. How do you reconcile those two things, that on the one hand, they are here to hold up the glorious parts of African American history, on the other hand, they're here to enjoy the thrill of living in a neighborhood that still has some aspects of dysfunction? Yeah, now this is, this is a great question. I mean, I mean, let's just talk about the history, right? We've got Langston Hughes lived here for a time period. Duke Ellington was here for a time period. But we also had Elaine Locke, right? He's the founder of the New Negro. That is the philosophy of the Harlem Renaissance. He was a professor at Howard University. He was at the Y talking about that philosophy uh, and basically came up with that idea uh, before he left and went, and went to Harlem. Right? I mean, and if you can, you can go on the walking trail here, you can go see where Elaine Locke lived in this neighborhood. People understand that and appreciate that. Uh, but at the same time, there are a set of people that you know, want to go to the Gibson, right? The Gibson is just down the block. They want to go to Marvin's. And, and Marvin's you know, paying homage to Marvin Gaye. Uh, but when you look at the Gibson, the Gibson looks like an abandoned building. You don't see any signage for it. 
you think you're going into the ghetto. Next to it, you got a liquor store that has the acrylic, right? Where you, you have plexiglass. You put the money down, they spin it around, they bring out your fifth. Uh, that is playing off iconic ghetto tropes. And the Gibson was once and is still one of the hottest bars in town. You go in there, you move from poverty to posh real quickly. But some of the reason that it's so attractive is that people are looking for the racial stereotypes. They're looking for that association between poverty, crime, blackness, and excitement. And that, that goes back to the 1920s, right? Remember, people used to slum in Harlem. Go listen to the jazz, right, in the 1920s. Whites didn't live in Harlem, but they would come into Harlem, and then they would go home. But they were looking for a stereotype, African Americans as performers, not as... Allow me to folks. interrupt. Compare and contrast the reasons people go to the Gibson with the reasons people come to Busboys and Poets. <laughs> Andy, maybe you could take that one. Uh, but, you know, look at this place. This place, look at the wall. You, you, it's not just African American history. This is social justice here, history in America and in the world. And this is what Andy has brought. And Andy, just like me, who didn't know the history. Andy probably knows the history better here. He's been a, a DC resident a lot longer than I have. But when he created Bus Boys, he went to the community leaders, the black community leaders, and says, what do you want in this space? You know, I bought it, I own it, I can do whatever. I want something that'll work, but I want something that'll work with the black leadership and with the neighborhood. I'm pretty sure the owners of the Gibson didn't ask the former and current leaders of this community what they wanted. Andy offers programming that caters to multiple people that are from all walks of life. This is one of the most diverse spaces in the Shaw U Street area. Most places segregate. This place has integration across race, class, sexual orientation, age. It's because Andy offers a product that caters to the tastes and preferences of all the people that live here and in a lot of people in DC. The Gibson, not so much. The cocktails are 15 to 20 dollars. So you're going in there, that's what you're spending. It's a different product and it caters to a different uh, group. How did U Street come to be known as Black Broadway? What are some of the important moments in this neighborhood history? Because U Street's fame preceded Harlem's fame. Talk yeah. about that. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's not just Black Broadway and the entertainers, it's the intellects, right? Before we had the entertainers, before this was Black Broadway, we had some of the greatest American minds at Howard University, right? So when we talk about this area was unique in terms of black history and culture, it's not just the music, it's the intellectualism. And that has to do with, with Howard University, right? I mean, after the Civil War, we had the Freemans Bureau, and they helped to found Howard University, right? And that brought the first African Americans that were trained at the University of Chicago, that were trained at Howard, uh, I'm sorry, at Harvard, at Yale. And they came to this community, uh, they lived in this community, and that is in part what starts the uh, movement um, for African Americans to come here. Also, the first African American public school in the nation's, in our nation, is here, M Street, right? Becomes Dunbar. So, African Americans from the South are moving here because they want their kids to get the best public education possible. I lived in Alexandria for a while, and I heard stories of, of residents that used to send their kids to M Street. They would sneak into DC just so they could go to that high school. So, you got M Street, then you got Howard. You got the professors there, and then you get the entertainers that come during the Black Broadway. Uh, and if you're interested in the Black Broadway area, uh, sort of era here, Blair Rubel's book. It's, it's out there. Uh, you know, get mine, get Blair's book. And I also want to mention Sabia Princess here. And Sabia, oh, I can't see her because someone's blocking her. But I, Raise your hand, Sabia. Around. But Sabia, Sabia wrote a book on gentrification in DC. We also worked on a book called Capital Dilemma, uh, which is a volume about the changes that are happening in DC and the inequality that's growing in DC. And, you know, Sabia's book also talks about 
why African Americans moved here. Well, you talk in the book, in chapter four, the black branding, which talks about how cultural tourism DCs sold Shaw's history in large measure to white newcomers, but a lot of these newcomers are here because they want to enjoy being a part of a historic neighborhood, such as this one. And yet, you're making the argument that by their mere presence here, they might be destroying the very history that they're interested in. What are they supposed to do about that? Yeah, it's a, it's a tough one. I remember asking one of the organizers at 1DC, her name's Jessica Rucker, and she grew up uh, just outside this neighborhood but spent you know, her youth hanging out here. Uh, and I asked her, I said, what do you think about you know, cultural tourism DC and all the signages? And she says, I think it's great. I'm so glad people are interested in the history, but I just wish that this was still a black majority that lived here, right? And you know, she had a tough time with this understanding that the history and preserving the history might have brought a lot of the white millennials here. But I think the problem though, maybe not the problem, but just it's a problem beyond this neighborhood. It's just race relations in the US. I mean, I, I interviewed a, a guy who owned a liquor store here, and, uh, and he said to me, Derek, an African-American guy, and he says, you know, Derek, I stopped selling 40s. And I said, oh, yeah, you know, I know D.C.'s banning the 40s, right? And he said, no, 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 I did it two years prior to D.C. banning selling of the 40s. And I said, why, why, why'd you do that? And he said, I was getting tired of white guys wearing glasses coming in my shop, getting 40s, <laughs> and asking for cigarettes, and, and he said he asked one guy, he said, where, where are you going? And he said, I'm going to a hood party. And I said, and, he, and this owner is saying to me, it was at that moment, when whites were coming in buying 40s and going to hood parties in the former hood, that something was wrong and he stopped selling the 40s. So, you know, they used to have hood parties right on college campuses, right? This is racism, it's discrimination. But now the hood parties are happening in the hood? There's something perverse and wrong with that. And that relates to this concept of living the wire. I also interviewed a couple people who were new white millennials talking about crime in this neighborhood like it was cool and hip. Like, oh, there was this carjacking and, you know, oh, whoa, and, and, and describing it to me, not like they were terrified, but like they were excited by that. I never thought I would hear that from somebody. Then I would go to, to an African-American dominated uh, neighborhood group and they would talk about the same crime like it was very problematic for their kids, for their lives. And there's a guy, Rob Sampson, he's a famous criminologist, he's at Harvard, he talked about in, in gentrified spaces, crime would be the thing that brought people together. Everybody wants to live in a safe neighborhood but I noticed with my time here that crime was being perceived differently by the different populations here and it wasn't bringing people together. Some people were living the drama and some people were living the wire. And that was making this neighborhood filled with micro-level segregation and an awful lot of conflict. How do the longtime residents of these neighborhoods feel about how the neighborhood is changing on the one hand there are all the amenities that they now have accessible to them. And you point out in the book that despite gentrification in Shaw U Street, it is still a very diverse community that has quite a few of long-term residents living here because there's still quite a bit of affordable housing in this community. How do long-time residents feel about how the community is changing, improving on the one hand, and about how their presence, on the other hand, seems to be less noticeable. So I'm probably being real negative right up to this point. It's like, but let me just say some positive things. That 30% of this neighborhood is still African American. The majority of them are, are low income because DC has some of the best affordable housing policies in the nation, right? I studied in New York, I studied in Chicago. The only reason this neighborhood is not 90% white is because DC has preserved affordable housing. 
Now, I interviewed a lot of the, the residents living in, in some of the subsidized housing, and a lot of them talked to me about during you know, the period that some whites are coming in to live the wire, this area is getting safer. For the last 30 years, crime has dipped tremendously, so crime is going down. And a lot of the residents living in the subsidized housing said, we really appreciate that. You know, this area is safer for our kids. Uh, but at the same time, some of the amenities that are coming in, the dog parks, the bike lanes, the coffee shops, Sonia Greer is here. She's got a documentary film all about those amenities that are not just coming into Shaw U Street, but they're coming into a lot of the neighborhoods. But these are not necessarily the amenities that low-income people want. You know, African Americans that don't bike that much in DC. 5% of the bike trips on the bike shares, which you can see outside, are taken by African Americans. 88% of the bike shares are by whites. Now, that's not necessarily a race thing, that could be an age thing. African Americans are older in this city than, than whites, but the amenities that are coming in are catering to the white millennials who are coming in. And there's a lot of resentment by long-term residents who've been advocating for other amenities and just haven't seen them come into this neighborhood till it flipped racially. Well, one of the things the bikes across the street do for long-time residents is give them a place to sit that's not on the sidewalk <laughs> when they're hanging out. Yeah, you can see. <laughs> but it's now time for questions from you, the members of the audience, so simply raise your hands and we'll get a microphone over to you for your question. I think there is one individual who is already ready. Um, so hi, so my name is Matthew Montos. I'm an uh, American University student. I'm a freshman here. Um, so actually, I'm doing a writing project um, for my writing professor who's in this very room, he's in the back. Hi. Um, <laughs> on the Edgewood Terrace apartments in Northeast DC. Um, well, you just talked about that a lot of the um, gentrification in this area is changing, and not a, a lot of the long-term residents really want that. Um, the research I've done in Edgewood has shown the same. Do you think that in other areas of DC, that that holds true, not only to Edgewood and U Street, but like per se, you know, the capital or um, in another area in, or an area in Southeast. Like, what are your opinions on, on how this affects the whole city, not just these two areas? Not just Shaw U Street, but how is this likely to affect Edgewood or Anacostia or Congress Heights? Right. I mean, look, the DC is gentrification gone wild, right? From 1990 to 2000, only about 5% of the low-income census tracts gentrified. Between 2000 and 2010, almost 50%, over 50% of the low-income housing, or low-income census tracts in this city gentrified. And so the dynamics that we're talking about in this community are affecting many communities, as you just mentioned, across DC. Uh, you know, H Street popped, right? We you know we know the baseball stadium is right northwest. Other areas, the southwest, gentrifying, and Anacostia is next, right? Andy, you you moved there, right? You got a space coming. In. You know you want to know where the gentrification is. Follow Andy. I'm not saying Andy's causing it. He's not, but but his he's he's moving right, and the developers move with him and talk with him about where's the next emerging market. Well, Andy right? would say he's not moving. He's adding another bus boys and poets. <laughs> right. But here, here's the thing. My research is all about how do we bring economic development that betters the lives of low-income people, that increases their life chances, that minimizes displacement and maximizes the ability of people to reach their innate potential. Right? So there are many low-income people that I've talked to in this city and elsewhere in other areas that are gentrifying. They want economic development. They want new jobs, they want new amenities. They don't want to live in a neighborhood that has concentrated poverty, but they don't want to be displaced. And you all know the history of our country with urban renewal in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. This is Mindy Fully Love. She wrote a book called Root Shock because the majority of people who got displaced when we did that renewal were African Americans. And when anybody gets their roots ripped out and gets displaced from their community, they get sick they die, their health diminishes, right? So that's what we gotta do. We gotta do equitable development. We gotta figure out as a city and as a nation, how can we do development in these areas, bring economic development, but do it in a way that keeps people in place and betters their life circumstances. But we don't do it that well. 
We redevelop the place and not the people in the place. And we displace. So that, that's why I would say that, you know, again, people I've talked with, they want redevelopment who are low income, but they want to benefit and they don't want to be displaced. I think we have a, another member of the audience who's ready. If not, I have a follow-up question. Uh, <clears throat> yes, I wish um, you would talk a little bit about Black Georgetown and what happened uh, with the housing code that was changed so that um, most of the African-American community there were forced out of their homes and the black community in Black Georgetown, um, as we know, spurred a lot of black leaders, including um, Althea Gibson and uh, the uh, president of Georgetown University, one of the presidents of Georgetown University who was passing and um, also had the oldest, has the oldest uh, black church, Mount Zion, uh, in this area. Uh, what happened there and how can we not repeat that here? Right. Uh, how can the millennials be a part of a movement to ensure that the black community remains, uh, has a, a cohesive, um, uh, remains cohesive so that they can remain strong and politically powerful? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So, we need uh, Derek Musgrove. He's not here tonight, but he's a historian. He's at the University of Maryland, uh, Baltimore County. He's writing a book about the history of black power and black politics in, in DC. He's about to finish it up. Uh, and Sabia and I, our, our uh, Capital Dilemma volume, he has probably what I think is the best chapter in it. And it goes through four waves of gentrification in Washington, DC, and it starts with Georgetown. Uh, and Georgetown started to gentrify, you know, maybe in the 1920s, definitely 1930s, 40s, it's, it's gentrifying. And think about the history of Georgetown. I mean, Georgetown's a port. Alexandria, port, used to be part of DC. Southwest, port. These areas, one, there was slave trading going on, right? Uh, the other thing is that many African Americans who were free settled there. Uh, but we started to get, when the federal city capital grows, government employees, they started to move to Georgetown and redeveloped it. And, and so African Americans have been displaced in many points in time in DC's history. It was Georgetown, then it was Foggy Bottom, then it was Southwest in the 1940s. And we can go Calorama, we can go look at, at uh, DuPont Circle, right? These areas used to be, or did not necessarily black majorities, but had a large black population and they got displaced. So I don't have the answers on how to prevent it necessarily, but to acknowledge that gentrification is not new to DC uh, is, is a good point. And I would, I'd encourage you to read Derek Musgrove's chapter. Nobody has talked yet about how this affects small black business owners in these communities. I lived on 8th Street between S and T Streets in Shaw for 20 years, and during the course of that time, there was Sam K Records on 7th Street, there were the cleaners that was owned by the Archie family on 7th Street. All of those are gone now. They've been replaced by a lot more upscale and hipper joints. But in the book, you tell the story about a hairstylist named Wanda Henderson, who, as that area around the Howard Theater was being developed, wanted to be there and somehow ended up being there. How did the city or the developer work that out? Yeah, I mean, you know, we always talk about residential displacement when we talk about gentrif gentrification, neighborhood change, and there's been very little literature on what happens to the small mom and pops, right? What happens to the minority owned businesses in a place like this? Uh, you know, before we get to Wanda, I mean, there used to be a bookstore not far from here called Sister Space. Sister Space got a controversial history, um, but 15, they got- 15 U Street. Yeah, they got displaced. They couldn't afford the rent, right? Um, so Wanda Henderson. Wanda Henderson is a fourth generation black Washingtonian. She grew up in the projects. She started a hair shop. She used to be on U Street. U Street started to develop. She couldn't afford the, the commercial rent anymore. She got displaced to 7th and T. 7th and T, just like 14th and U, was, had a troubled history. I mean, it, it, there's a lot of drug dealing going on on 7th and T. And that's right over by the Howard Theater. So I'm sure many of you have been over there. But it's all redeveloped now. But 
You know, when I started this project, the Howard Theater was in disarray. It was coming down. Uh, and, and there were drug runners in the alleys. Uh, you know, and so Wanda's there, she's got her hair shop, and she knows development is coming. She works with uh, 1DC to strike up a community benefits agreement with the developer. Now the developer of that spot is Chip Ellis. Chip Ellis is also a fourth generation black Washingtonian, but he went to Howard. He's part of the black bourgeoisie, he's part of the black elite, he worked for Bill Clinton. He's able to fundraise a lot of money. And he, want, he wanted that, he, he redeveloped the Howard, he redeveloped Progression Plaza, where Wanda once was, but is now. Uh, the United Negro College Fund now was out in Fairfax, now they have their headquarters right there. Chip did that. But Chip, you know, he wants black history, but wants upscale black history. He wants a nice coffee shop. Uh, he wants uh, an art gallery. He didn't necessarily want Wanda there. Wanda. She caters to the people, some of the students who go to Howard, but she also caters to the subsidized residents that are in Lincoln, Westmoreland 1 and 2, which is right across the street from this development. We call it LW. Yeah. <laughs> so Wanda worked with 1DC. 1DC worked with Chip Ellis. They struck a community benefits agreement. And Wanda got displaced, went up Georgia Avenue for a time being, but when they redeveloped the space, she got to come back for five years at a below market rent. Now that's not something the city did. That's something that the residents that were in that space working with 1DC did. And Chip didn't want to do it, but he was forced to do it. And now Wanda, you go on 7th Street, she's got a nice shop. But she's only there for five years at a blow market rent. And I talked to Wanda, I said, Wanda, how's it going? This place looks packed, it looks great. She says, yeah, it's going well, but I don't know if when the rents go to market rate, where I'm, if I'm going to be able to afford it, I might get displaced. So I told her, I said, hey, Wanda, you going to start cutting my hair? You know, it's a black-owned business, a black, you know, hair shop, the black barber shops. It's got a vibe. It's got a, a, a thing going on, right? And she was like, I'm not sure if I want to do that. But, you know, some of the small black businesses, they're going to have to diversify because there's all this aggregate income out there. And there's a lot of whites now that live right in the close proximity of where Wanda's shop is. But... But Wanda was able to come back, and now Wanda has a chance and an opportunity to do some black capitalism, right? And Wanda's not the only one. I just want to talk. I mean, we got Industrial Bank still here. Doyle Mitchell, his family, has owned it for generations. They're doing just fine. Rick Lee, Lee's Flower Shop, he's doing all right. So some black businesses are making it. Others are struggling. But we do need to do more to help the struggling mom and pop businesses so they don't get displaced. Next You, sir, it is my understanding, are the head of the Washington Urban League. That's correct. Please so, tell us your name. George Lambert, uh, good evening, delighted to be here. So just a couple things, a few observations. Um, I'm a firm believer that those who've been part of the fabric of the city should also have an opportunity to be part of the redevelopment of our city. And the challenge on that is the balance in terms of making that happen. You've talked about several things. So, so one of the things I want to do, I want to invite you to come to the Greater Washington Urban League to have the same kind of discussion and dialogue. I can guarantee you a more diverse audience. <laughs> I can do that for sure. All right, sounds but good. I, but I also think it would give you a different perspective as well. I really do in all seriousness. Yeah. But there are challenges. Um, you know, so when we look at what's happening with regard to gentrification, you mentioned earlier about the bike lanes. I mean, clearly the bike lanes have been a major challenge to many of our churches. It's no question about it, all right? So they really are. I, I will tell you, so, you know, one of the other things you mentioned, and I just want to make a little bit of a correction on it with regard to Alexandria, some folks sneaking in. Quite frankly, the city of Alexandria did not integrate their schools until 1970. So they weren't sneaking in. They had no other choice but to come here. I'm a native Washingtonian, so when I kind of look around, um, the city looks nothing like the city that I grew up in as a child. It really has changed. But I do invite you to come to the Greater Washington Urban League. We'd love to have this dialogue. As I said, we'll certainly give you a different perspective. Coach, I invite you to come as well. We'd love to have you. So I'll leave it there. Final thing I will say, how many of you take the metro, right on the metro? Walter Washington, who some of you know, was the uh, first mayor of the District of Columbia. 
I was having a dialogue with some folks several months ago and mentioned to me, so, you know, when the metro system was being put in uh, quite a few years ago, it was a system that brought folks into the city and took them out very quickly. Because pretty much all of you lived in the suburbs then, okay? Into the city and out very quickly. It was Walter Washington who insisted that there needed to be a system that would move folks around, a track that would move folks around in the city. But for there, we have the green line now, okay? But that was Walter Washington that did that. So, you know, I really appreciate hearing this. It's a great book. I'm looking forward to reading. Would love to have more dialogue with you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, I would, real quick, I'll do real quick, but I'll definitely come. I would love to start the dialogue and, uh, and you know, you mentioned uh, Walter Washington, but we also have to mention Walter Fauntroy, right? Walter Fauntroy helped get home rule, but he also fought, I mean, he fought for this neighborhood forever, right? He prevented the federal bulldozers from coming up from Southwest and leveling this neighborhood. And he also, I mean, we got the Metro here, the Howard Metro and the U Street Metro due to, due to him. Um, so he's another, you know, black leader that we really need to talk about when we talk about the history of this neighborhood. There's another book that talks about a lot of that. It's called Dream City <laughs> by Harry Jaffe and uh, Tom Sherwood, right, yes. <laughs> Who's next? Thank you. It's a pleasure to see Kojo Namdi in person. And I just want to say, George Lambert, I'm involved in some dialogue with the black and Jewish community here in Washington. So my question to the author is, are there any cities or countries around the world that have done a better job of this, whether in the United States or we talk a lot about the Jewish community and some of our struggles and um, the, the black Jewish dialogue is, is really part of the reason I'm here. So just a thought. And I'm a native Washingtonian and I never came to 14th and U Street and I live around the corner. So it's kind of a kind of a weird uh, moment. But anyway, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, it's I mean, it's a challenge, right? I mean, it's, we're looking at, at race in America, and race in America affects all American cities. So who's done it well? I, I don't know if there's any city that has done it so well, but I will say, look at, look at Central Harlem. There are 20,000 residents that live in subsidized housing, in the public housing in Central Harlem. They're not getting displaced because they have some of the best public housing in the country. I look at the south side of Chicago. About 20,000 residents got displaced from Bronzeville on the south side of Chicago. They lived in the Robert Taylor home, Stateway Gardens, Ida B. Wells. Uh, that development is not going well at all because all of the residents in subsidized housing are being displaced. I think DC is doing a pretty good job in terms of subsidized housing, but we have to go beyond housing. This is not necessarily a housing issue. Just because you got Long-term residents who are in subsidized housing living next to the millennials doesn't mean they're going to interact. We need to grease the wheels of social integration in the gentrified spaces. And because of race in America, it's not so easy to get people to interact. And we don't have organizations with the mission of integrating people of different backgrounds. HUD's not funding any of that. The D.C. government's not funding any of that. And Frankly, no city government is funding that. So until we start changing the priorities of our funding, we got the community development block grant coming from HUD that could do that. Trump wants to zero that out. So where's the money going to come from to fund an organization like One DC, Empowered DC, maybe a new organization that is mixed with millennials and long-term residents to come together to think about where the spaces that we can work together to build a more cohesive community but that's what we need to do. I haven't seen any city do that very well. You mentioned internationally a couple of years ago there was a controversy in Seoul, South Korea because gentrification can be controversial even when race is not involved. This controversy involved the Gangnam Style guy whose name I can't recall right now, but he was involved in putting up a new development in Seoul, South Korea and causing poor residents to be displaced and as a result of that controversy, he withdrew from that development and apologized to people because, as I said, it can be controversial even when race is not involved. But yes, who gets the microphone next?
Um, thank you. Uh, good evening. Um, my name is Khalil Shahid, and I'm uh, actually. Uh, Would you stand, please? Uh, I don't know if I can. You can't. <laughs> <laughs> it's tight back there. Hopefully, you can get up. Uh oh. It's just that you're so far back that I, even I can't see you. Okay, good. All right. Sorry. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm, I'm actually uh, I'm a researcher on uh, urban policy and environmental sustainability. And so, uh, sort of two comments, questions. One, uh, and I haven't read the book yet. I, I want to read it. It sounds great. But too often, uh, a lot of our discussions around gentrification tend to treat the problem as one of you know individual decision makers, whether it's millennials moving in or developers. But can you speak to what incentive and what role does city policy have to play in really incentivizing this and really driving this? And the second point to that is, you know, the issue around, you know, whether it's public housing or whether there's good housing policy that allows some people to stay, uh, you know, we're not really addressing the fact that there is a property value to white identity that black people just don't have. And this is regardless of social economic status. So you could have a middle class black neighborhood that just doesn't have the, the ability to power value the way, the way a similar white neighborhood does have. And we suffer a market penalty in urban land markets as black people when we're the majority in a space. And so the city has an incentive to decentralize our, whether it's residential or socially, to, to, to decentralize us to increase the value of that space. And white people don't suffer that same market penalty when they're the majority in the space. If anything, they get a bump. And so can you just respond to that? Thank you. City policy and how race powers value. All right, let's, let's take the more controversial one, which I, I think is the latter. Um, look, we got race, race and ethnic inequality along income and along wealth, right? And so we just gotta acknowledge that up front, that with the same education, uh, African Americans are gonna earn less than whites, and Hispanics are gonna earn, and Latinos less than whites. And that inequality in income and in wealth drives a lot of development, right? So the city wants to get millennials in, and the majority that are coming in are white, because whites have more money. Now a lot of the Millennials, they're not rich, but their parents are. And their parents are floating the bill for their condo down here, right? And if you're African American and you're a millennial, your parents may not have, on average, your parents aren't gonna have the same wealth. So we have to acknowledge that racial inequality and how that shows up. But nonetheless, even with that inequality, you know, we still have African American, the black middle class tripled since the 1960s. We got PG County, this is one of the richest black suburbs in the country. But PG County doesn't look like Fairfax County, which is majority white, right? There's the inequality showing up. But, you know, so the inequality definitely plays out and that's why the majority of gentrification in our country is white led. But we do, did have black gentrification in Harlem and on the south side of Chicago. So that, that's one part. All right, now, now with the city policy. All right, so we got the control board that comes in, right? Takes out Marion Barry when he gets elected for the fourth time. And that control board wants to be fiscally prudent. And they got Anthony Williams on it, right? And he's the CFO of the city. And then he becomes mayor. Well, when he becomes mayor, he starts, you know, he wants to bring back 100,000 people to this city. And he starts developing the bike lanes, right? He's investing in that. I got this map in the book that shows how many bike lanes were in this area in a certain time period in the 90s. Then you look at, you know, 2010, this area is bike lane crazy, bike accessible, like, you know, but that is a city policy. I interviewed the, the planning office staff and I said, what, what's going on here with you guys, the implementation, implementation of the bike lanes? And this is now Adrian Fenty's time period. And they said, hey, this is Adrian's economic development tool. He's putting in the bike lanes into, you know, uh, Capitol Hill East and this neighborhood. And he knows he's gonna be driving the preferences and, and trying to get millennials to come here. So those two areas have disproportionate amount of bike lanes. So the amenities that the city is supporting is stimulating the gentrification. Can dog parks be included in that? Yeah, we can put the dog park. There's a story about the dog park. First off-leash dog park in Washington, D.C. is on Rhode Island Ave in the middle of this community. Uh, that's 2008. 
half a million dollars gets appropriated to do the, the bike lane, but the, I mean, sorry, the dog park. The dog park, though, who was advocating for that? It was a white-led neighborhood association. And I interviewed African-American dog owners who lived around the dog park, and they weren't utilizing it. I said, what, what's going on? Why don't you use the dog park? I said, oh, no, 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 no. We're not walking our dogs there. That space is not for us. And we weren't involved in the politics of bringing that dog park uh, to fruition. And, you know, there's a, a basketball court, there's a soccer field, there's a skate park in that same park. It's like four parks in one. How many people have been, to, I know some of you have been to that dog park and to that space, right? So, so in, it's the, 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 the soccer fields still haven't been rehabbed. There's no field, there's a dirt, and the goals are like falling down. And, and a lot of Latinos and Hispanics use that. The basketball courts, majority of African Americans use that. They did finally rehab them, but when I started doing my work, it still said Washington Bullets. The bullets changed to the Wizards in 1997. So that, that basketball court was in rehab since and probably before 1997. And, and so people that have been long-term residents around that park were frustrated. Like, we've been advocating for years to get the city to do something here. But now we got the white millennials coming in. They're forming their own civic association. Man, they just got a half a million dollars for their dog park. So now you can kind of see the political change and also understand with the new amenities, the resentment. I, I talk about in the book, this is... There's political displacement and cultural displacement going on in this community, and they're related. And so the dog park kind of uh, symbolizes that. But you did mention that. one park in which all of the communities seem to be getting together for different reasons, and that I think is the park at 11th and Rhode Island Avenue. Oh, yeah, that's Northwest. what I'm talking about. But so at the skate park, yeah. that's where the, the youth, though, the younger generation, right, they're all, they're different races, ethnicities, and they're having a great time, right? They're showing each other tricks. You know, and sometimes I think about a community like this, it once was concentrated in poverty, and now it's mixed income, mixed race, and it may not benefit uh, the older generations, it may not benefit the millennials that much, but if the millennials stay and have kids, and the long-term residents, they, they have kids, or start to have kids, and, and they all get together at that skate park, I think the way in which those kids perceive race and difference is going to be profoundly different than any of us. So it may take a generation for us to really understand the positive consequences of a community like this. Um, are we taking any more questions? We have time two, more two questions. more questions, yes. Yeah. Um, Francisco. Um, in the seven years now that I've been living in DC, I've seen the arts as mer emerge as a mechanism to bridge these gaps, um, or at least to bring people together. Uh, I, I've seen that a lot in Anacostia and other quote unquote places that are on the front lines of gentrification. I'm wondering, um, where do you think, is there promise? Where do you think that um, we could be a little more thoughtful about how we use those arts? Um, to bring people together without papering over what was already there? And where are some places in D.C. where you think maybe uh, this could be utilized more? I'm thinking maybe to Tacoma Park or even near Cedar Hill. Thank you. You say in the book that one of the differences with gentrification in this area is that it wasn't typical as the, in that the artists weren't the first ones to show up. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, you look at, like, the Lower East Side, um, New York City, Manhattan, Right? The first wave of gentrifiers, Wicker Park is another place. The first wave of gentrifiers there are the artists. Here they're not. They're the political appointees, right? I mean, that, that's what I'm saying. Like, this area is different. We don't have the same art base. And also, the, the, the neighborhood is changing so drastically that artists can't really live. I mean, artists aren't rich. You know, only a few of them get rich. And Andy knows about this. I mean, he supports the poets, right? Uh, but they struggle. So the artists, you know, I think art is a way to bring people together. And again, Andy illustrates this with his programming here. He brings, you know, musicians, poets, authors, um, and you get a diverse audience in spaces like this. Not so diverse tonight. We're, we, you know, we're there, but we got, you know. But it, it, it's amazing how art, though, uh, brings people together and also eases the tension, right? And and so it is a way, it is a mechanism uh, to bring people together, but also the artists can't always live 
in the spaces that are gentrifying because they, they can't afford it. But, you know, there is the D, and Andy has got his hand up because he wants to probably mark, there's the DC Ideas Fest, which is next week, and there are a whole host of artists that are coming in to talk about the changing dynamics of this city, and, and maybe we can get some of the artists involved. Blair Rubel also has a book, How Art Has Brought People Together Across Difference Around the World. Uh, and I definitely recommend that book. But Andy, I know you want to get here. And Sonia, I see you just got a drink, but you've talked about this, about artists, and, and, and you are an artist, right? So, I mean, in a, in a way, you're a film, filmmaker. So maybe you could talk about art and art spaces and how maybe that would bring people together but, and what the city could do to perpetuate that. So I don't know, Andy and then but, Sonia. But, but I warned you about passing the mic to Andy. I know, but Andy only got 30 seconds. Okay. I need a drink, my mouth is, you know. So let Andy, let Andy go. Since drunk. it's all your so, fault, Andy. So thank you very much. Uh, there's a couple of comments about the art. There's a, there was an, um, a conference yesterday with the Urban Land Institute. Uh, lots of people were here from different walks of, uh, of life that, that really do talk about these issues of gentrification and change and art and so on. There's a great organization uh, called Art Space. They actually create art living spaces here in D.C. There's one in Brookland only. There, there's one also in Mount Rainier. But, uh, but one in Brooklyn where they build the entire building, uh, many units, uh, 100 I think, 80 units, where it's affordable housing for artists. And uh, I mean seriously affordable, like the, 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 the cost for an apartment is like, I think like maybe $700, $800 for a nice apartment with a studio, plus there's a, uh, a workspace down below. So that's one way to do it. But the other thing I think that's important about gentrification, we keep talking about it like it's gravity, like it's uh, a force of nature. It doesn't have to be. I think one thing we have not done so well is preserve public housing. Uh, without preserving public housing, you will have this continuous gentrification. There's not enough units to sprinkle around between uh, you know, the affordable type units that can um, you know, help the folks that are being pushed out. There was a, this, this project called Hope Six, that was the big project where people, you know, in a, in a public housing project are pushed out, they're given vouchers, they're spread all over the city, the, the development gets redeveloped with mixed use and, and inclusionary zoning type of stuff and multiple levels of income, and then supposedly the people that have been displaced for four years, five years, six years, sometimes even longer, are supposed to come back to live in that, uh, in the, in that space, they would have it, 10% of the people return. Most of the people just dissipate and go everywhere. And I think unless we preserve public housing, for instance, like Berry Farm that's happening right now yep. in east of the river, which, again, it's a Hope Six project now. It's, it's not called Hope Six, but people are being pushed out. Uh, the, the building will be rebuilt, and then people are not going to come back. You're going to continue this cycle of gentrification. It's not busboys and poets. It's not the cause of gentrification. <laughs> yeah, but before Sonia goes, Andy, that was great. I was good. I mean, come on, it's Andy. Like, mm -hmm. you know, he's talking. So one of the things that's interesting about this neighborhood is it didn't have a lot of public houses. So the riots ripped this neighborhood apart. 7th Street burned, 14th Street burned. Uh, Walter Fauntroy mobilized the black churches and he got low interest loans from HUD, the Department of Housing and Urban Development and FHA. And the black churches built the subsidized housing, most of it that is in this community. Uh, and they, they own it, and it's something called place-based section eight. I, I won't get into the details of it, but it is subsidized housing not owned and controlled by the DC Housing Authority. What Andy's talking about, Barry Farm, owned by the DC Housing Authority. So a lot of the subsidized housing that is here that remains, it's because of the black churches that mobilized after the 68 riots. And so we need to acknowledge that. that the, and now the black churches kind of have this community in terms of the low-income black community in their hands. They've got to decide. They could sell off that stuff. And some of the black churches have. Uh, but if we are going to keep this community diverse racially, some of it is in the hands of the black churches that are here. So anyway, and I, Sonia, I know you want to say something about the artists. Maybe we'll get back to that, not about housing. Oh, Sabia wants to chime she, in. So. She's going to Go talk ahead. later about that. All right, cool. <laughs> oh, this um, is the last comment. Okay. <laughs> well, thanks to everyone, Andy, Kojo, uh, WAMU, Politics and Prose. I guess I have a question. Having grown up here um, like a while ago, um, 
this community meant safety for us. I can recall being a little kid and my dad taking me to um, Ben's and I met Stokely Carmichael. I mean, I, can, I, I was little and I remember looking up. He was absolutely gorgeous. I was smitten. <laughs> but um, the community... Uh, right. Wait, Sabine, don't tell your husband that now. Well, you know. He knows. Yeah, she was two years old. <laughs> exactly. But so, you know, the community meant safety. It meant a place where we could go. I remember for our parents, it meant somewhere where you could go shopping and people wouldn't look at you funny. They would let you try on things. You didn't have to feel uncomfortable about, am I going to be rejected? Am I going to be able to sit here and eat? So that was something really tangible. Can you talk about U Street in that frame of, you know, more than a ghetto and trouble? And I realized this was pre-cracked. It was pre a lot of stuff. So I'm dating myself in a sense. But can you talk about that sense of belonging and how valuable right. that is for people? Extremely important, right? I mean, people's networks are critical to their survival, no matter what income level the community is, but particularly for low-income people, uh, particularly for people who are being discriminated against, who can't just go downtown and go shopping, right? That's what Sabia's talking about. Can't just go to certain theaters, can't go to certain places, can't even live in certain communities. I mean, there's restricted covenances uh, in certain areas in, in D.C. So having that space it, is critical. And also, we have to acknowledge that the black political power of Washington, D.C. originates in this community, right? Stokey Carmichael is hanging out here. Uh, Marion Barry is, you know, basically... That's Pride Inc. And Pride Inc. isn't in this community, it's just on the periphery of this community, but he is cutting his political chops here, right? So it's a social network that is important, but also it's the political strength. This is the heart and soul of black Washington. Black Washington has home rule because of the leaders that either lived here or hung out in this community. And so when we talk about the white millennials coming in and the city council going from majority black to majority white, it's something that is traumatic to this place and maybe not as traumatic in New York City or in Chicago because in those places there was always a local government. It didn't take a black political core to pull it from the federal government. So this place is unique and it has very deep meanings uh, for people because of the discrimination but also because of the black political power that originated here. And people need to recognize that and understand it. And when you hear long-term residents being really resentful and upset about what's happening in Shaw U Street, but it was happening in the city, it's related to that context. And that context, which Sabia talked about, has to be acknowledged. And it's, and it's a set of knowledge that a lot of my students who, I, say, I ask my students, I'm like, how, many, how long you been in D.C.? They're like, I don't know, six months, a year, two years, and they're moving in, and coming into these areas, but they don't know the history. So it's really important to know that history, and then maybe you can understand why somebody's upset when you're coming into a community thinking you're going to be a do-gooder and you're just here to help. The book is called Race, Class, and Politics in the Cappuccino City. Derek S. Hira. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.